Prologue Two years ago The peddler watched, one eyebrow raised, as the young man approached him on the road. Despite the young man's fine clothing and clean-cut appearance, he had a look of desperation about him. Ah, well. The young were always passionate about something, and it was following those passions that got them into trouble. The peddler pulled his mule to the side of the road to allow the young man's horse to pass him by. But instead, the young man halted his horse, dismounted, practically grabbed the peddler by the collar he was so frantic. You're a traveling peddler, are you not? No, I'm the king of Calia, the peddler wanted to say sarcastically. But sarcasm never won him patronage. Indeed I am, sir, the peddler said instead, touching the brim of his threadbare cap respectfully. Are you looking to sell something? The young man perked up. I am. Is there anything you're looking to buy? The peddler eyed the young man's horse. You've a fine mount, sir. Would you be willing to part with him? The young man frowned. I... I would prefer not to. I've a long way to go, and it will only be longer if I have to travel on foot. Hmm. What about your clothes, then? I'd be happy to sell you something if you don't have a second outfit on you, and you'd still have money to spare. The young man looked down at his clothing, as if just remembering what he was wearing. I don't have a change of clothing. I kind of left in a hurry. And I... No, I don't want to sell this, either. You don't want to sell your horse. You don't want to sell your clothes, the peddler mocked. What do you want to sell, then? Or be on your way, if all you want to do is waste my time. No, I... The young man stopped and waved his hand in the air. What about this? A shiny gold ring glinted in the sunlight. Perhaps, the peddler said. Let me take a look at it. The young man tugged the ring off his finger. He held it a moment, reluctant to let it go. Sweat started to beat on his forehead. Well? The peddler held his hand out. Do you want me to look at it or not? I... The young man seemed to be having trouble forming words. The peddler reached out, his dirty, gnarled fingers closing over the gold band the young man held between his fingers. A jolt passed through the young man, and he startled, but the peddler didn't seem to notice. He took the ring from the young man and held it up to the light, turning it this way and that. The young man panted slightly, getting his breath back. The peddler bit the ring, then inspected it again. Satisfied, he said, "'It's genuine, all right,' I'll take it. The young man blew out a breath, and then the two men engaged in a round of haggling. They settled the price, and the peddler paid the young man, commenting, This little ring will be worth something once I melt it down, I'm sure. Melt it down? But can't you see? The young man trailed off. See what? The peddler asked. Ah, uh, it's not important. It's not mine anymore, anyway. Do whatever you want with it. I will. The peddler touched the brim of his cap again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good day. The young man mounted his horse and rode off. The peddler watched him go, then turned back to look at his new acquisition. When he had touched the ring, he had felt the spark signaling the presence of magic. But now, as he studied the ring closer, he realized its magic was for something extremely specific, and something he had no use for. Worthless piece of junk he muttered, shoving the ring in his pocket. He withdrew his hand. Instead of the gnarled, dirty fingers the young man had seen, the hand that emerged was pale and perfect, with long black fingernails. The peddler's form changed as well, growing taller, younger, leaner. Long golden hair flowed down his back, with two black strands highlighting his pale face. King Baller, king of the Ancelli court, sneered at the waning sunlight overhead. Fortunately, it was nearly sunset, although being out in the daylight at any point was taxing on the Ancelli fay. As the king, he had a higher tolerance than his subjects, but not by much. The useless magic ring felt like a boulder in his pocket. He sighed. Collecting magical items was proving to be a worthless endeavor. He was searching for something ancient and specific, 
an item that had most likely been lost or buried by now. There had to be another way to unseal the god's prison. Gathering random magical pieces wasn't working, but perhaps tapping into a very specific kind of magic would do the trick? It was worth trying. Perhaps it would also allow him to wander the gifted lands at any hour, not just during the evening to write after sunrise. He smiled to himself. Think of all the havoc he could create if he could stay above ground for longer. And if his idea failed, well, as a fey king, he had all the time in the world to come up with another plan. All the time, in all the worlds. Chapter One The pale blue-green jewel winked in the sunlight that streamed through our large front windows. "'I think this will be a better fit for you, Andri,' my father, Pazzo, said. He shook his long white blonde hair out of his eyes. "'Tourmaline is a stone of stabilization, of protection. And,' he winked, "'it matches your eyes.' "'Ha! Huh, very funny, father,' I said, widening my dark brown eyes at him. "'You never know. Perhaps your other self will have blue eyes.' I smiled sadly as I reached for the teal-colored, slightly translucent pendant. It was a lovely jewel, and would probably make a good soul stone for me. But... <sighs> We've tried two others, and neither of them worked, I sighed. Perhaps we should just accept that I'll never be able to transform. Pazzo closed my fingers around the gem. The thin leather cord attached to it trailed from my closed fist. Oh, Andre, don't say never. You'll get it soon, I'm sure. I gazed out the window. Our next-door neighbor was outside, beating her rugs on the stone path. Dust clouded up, and she stopped to sneeze. I sighed again and met my father's concerned eyes. <sighs> I'll try, father, but it's hard not to be discouraged. I understand. He patted my hand. I'll go and get all the things we need for the soul stone creation. Pazzo stood up and disappeared into the kitchen. I opened my hand and studied the tourmaline, and the faint scar on my palm next to it. Yet another cut was coming. Great. Here in the kingdom of Anlin, the people were able to shift forms, learning at a young age which animal would be their second self. By adolescence, the shapeshifters had mastered their ability, usually with the help of a soul stone. The more you used your soul stone, the more your magic became tied to it. So, picking a gem to become your soul stone was quite important. Fully connecting yourself to your soul stone required a small ceremony that involved a bit of bloodletting. I had merged with two other soul stones before this, and both times, the gems had ultimately failed. With the first soul stone, I had been unable to transform, even after years of trying. Pazzo, after much observation, had decided that perhaps I hadn't merged with the soul stone like we had thought, and we got rid of the jewel. The second soul stone cracked right after I joined with it. The failed soul stone issue wouldn't have been so worrying, except for one other fact. I was past the age of my majority. Everyone else had mastered shifting by the age of thirteen or fourteen. When my birth parents had brought me to Pazzo, a well-respected scholar, for help, I had already been fifteen, much older than other first-time shifters. They never came back for me. I never saw them around the capital city, where Pazzo lived. Perhaps they had left the kingdom of Anlin altogether. I suppose they knew deep down that I'd never master shifting, and they had decided it was a convenient way to be rid of me. But Pazzo and his mate, Denon, never made me feel inferior, even though the cloud of my failure always hung over my head. Instead, they had taken me in, quietly adopting me, and proving to be truer parents than the ones who had left me behind ever were. Pazzo, his arms full, dropped several items on the table in front of me. I began organizing them, used to the routine by now. The candle went to my left, bandages and towels to my right, the small black pot I moved in front of me. I picked up the pitcher and poured water into the pot, while Pazzo heated a knife in the fireplace. Hmm. Something was missing. Oh, yes. I jumped up and walked into the kitchen, 
scooping up some jars of dried herbs on the open pantry shelf. Thank you, Andre, Pazzo said. There was too much for me to carry. You're welcome, I said, as I added a scoop from each jar to the pot. Pazzo finished heating the knife and placed it on the table to cool. I hung the pot on a hook over the fire. While I waited for the water to boil, I said to Pazzo, Do you think this time it will work? Pazzo nodded. Of course it will. This time we have the perfect jewel for you. And remember, you're not the only one who is a late shifter. Queen Jenica of Calia was a late shapeshifter, and now she's quite adept at transforming. I smiled indulgently. Whenever I felt down about my lack of shapeshifting ability, Pazzo often invoked Queen Jenica of Calia. I had never met her, but apparently a few years ago she had met my father, and he had given her the gem that would become her soul stone. She had been around my age, nineteen, when she first learned to shift into her dragon form. I refrained from commenting that the queen already had a background in magic, so she at least understood the theory even if she couldn't do it. And she hadn't even known she could become a dragon until she met my father, so she hadn't known what she was missing. I acutely knew what I was unable to do. Also, from the stories my father told me, Queen Jenica had shown signs of shape-shifting power when she was young. I had never manifested any powers, hence my abandonment on Pazzo and Denon's doorstep. My silence must have spoken volumes to Pazzo, for he stood up and embraced me. We'll get it this time, Andre. We will. Tears pricked my eyes. His encouragement gave me hope, as did the knowledge that he didn't view it as a me issue, but a we issue. The water in the pot started bubbling. I grabbed a towel and took the pot from the flame, placing it carefully on the table. Shall we? Pazzo held up the now cooled knife. I nodded and held out my hand, palm up. Pazzo made a quick cut near my old scar and tipped my hand sideways so my blood dripped into the pot. I scrunched my nose, disgusted by the odd metallic herbal smell in the air. When the water turned muddy, he put the necklace into the pot, pendant first. Junctus. May the two become one. Fiat. There was a flash, and I gagged as the sickly smell grew stronger. Then it disappeared. The pot was empty, except for my necklace. I grabbed a strip of cloth and bandaged my hand, then reached into the pot and grabbed my new soul stone. It shimmered in my hand, bright with new magic and full of promise. Just like the other ones had. How does it feel? Pazzo searched my face, wide-eyed and curious. I touched the stone with my good hand. It felt warm and hummed with a pleasant energy. Not bad. Time will tell, I guess. I guess, Pazzo echoed. He sounded disappointed, as if he expected a stronger reaction. I felt a bit guilty for not being more enthusiastic, but I also didn't want to get my hopes up again. My father sighed. Ah, <sighs> well, let's clean up. And then we can try... There was a knock at the front door. Pazzo frowned. We had been so busy with the soul stone... We hadn't noticed anyone approaching the house. He stood up and opened the front door. A middle-aged woman fell into the room, frantic. Oh, Pazzo, I'm so glad you're home. I need your help, right away. You've been listening to Air of Illusions and Others, book six in the Kingdom Legacy series. Want to know what happens next? Air of Illusions and Others is now available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, and other places you like to get your ebooks, audiobooks, and paperbacks. You can even get a copy at my site, Roshni.net. So please pick up a copy and happy reading, or happy listening!